Welcome to the Scaling Tech Podcast, where we help you manage your growing engineering team. Through expert interviews, we help you navigate the challenges of leading, hiring, growing, and nurturing your tech team to deliver the value your customers demand. Brought to you by agilityfeet.com, experts in staffing engineering teams in Latin America for clients globally. I seem to run have seen a lot of groups where they kind of got the test part but didn't do the refactor part very much and they've let that part get out of control and so they've they've been creating tests but when it's become hard to create the test they don't say hey wait a minute it shouldn't be this hard you know and they'll write their 30 lines of setup and you know get everything going and you know they're testing and they're trying but it's it's harder than it has to be Welcome to the Scaling Tech Podcast, the podcast for leaders of growing software engineering teams. I'm Aaron Sahn, here as always with my co-host, David Alfaro. How are you doing today, David? I'm doing fine. It's hot here in Costa Rica and it's about to rain, so we better rush the introduction <laughs> because it's about to rain and it, it will get noisy, so let's start. <laughs> we have, we have uh, yeah, not only noise, but it is not unusual sometimes in our experience that uh, when it rains, the internet goes out. And that doesn't always seem like an obvious connection, does it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, yeah, we, we have learned to... Uh, we have adapt to that reality in Costa Rica. Right. <laughs> it's, it's natural now. <laughs> uh, well, speaking of adapting, uh, today we had a really interesting conversation with Bill Wake uh, about a lot of different topics around extreme programming, which um, you know, I'm making a segue there from adapting, you know, constantly learning your programming, uh, learning, growing your programming skills, let's say, uh, working in mobs or pairs or ensembles, working with TDD and constantly improving that whole continuous improvement aspect of Agile uh, applied to development in particular. So uh, it was a really interesting conversation. What did you think, David? What was uh, something to look out for? You know, Bill is the kind of person I always wanted to have a beer with in a bar. Like, <laughs> I just, I, it, I really admire him. It's, it's, I, he, he really helped me uh, to understand very important core concepts about uh, XP, about pair programming, about uh, test-driven development. So I, I, without, I never had the chance to, to meet him, uh, but now I had. So it was a very nerdy. <laughs> Very geeky conversation, so it was fun. I I had a lot of fun and 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 good advice about growing as a developer, uh, some tips. So it's it's going to be nice. Yeah, yeah, it was definitely uh, yeah great conversation. Bill is a really nice guy to speak with, uh, and um, yeah, I think, you know some of the some of the episodes that we do in the Scaling Tech Podcast are going to be very process oriented. Um, sometimes you know on the businessy side of engineering management, and then other times like this one are going to be very tech focused. And yeah, it was a wonderful conversation with Bill, and I got to learn a new phrase today too: uh, taste the peanut butter. Uh, which uh, I'm a big fan of peanut butter personally. Uh, so I was excited to learn that phrase. And you'll have to, uh, if you're not familiar with it already, as I wasn't, you'll have to listen to today's episode to figure out what does that mean in a programming context? Taste the peanut butter. <laughs> let's get to it. All right. Let's get to our interview with Bill Wake. I'm very pleased to have William Wake joining us today on the Scaling Tech Podcast. I met Bill nearly 20 years ago when he was an extreme programming consultant hired by my boss at the time. And Bill taught our team about test-driven development techniques. He was the first person to expose me to the concepts of agile software development. He's well known in the agile coaching community and has worked in that capacity uh, for a number of companies independently and through industrial logic. He's the author of several books on extreme programming, refactoring and design patterns. You can learn more about him at his extreme programming website, xp123.com, and by following him on Twitch, where he regularly does live coding sessions. Welcome to the Scaling Tech Podcast, Bill. Thanks. Nice to be here. That's great to have you. Uh, let's let's start with a definition. Um, what What is extreme programming? Uh, well, it's a, it's a, I guess you'd say a process or a process template maybe uh designed by kent beck uh gosh yeah everything's over 20 years now I'm, I'm <laughs> um but uh just 
uh, designed a, a few years back, uh, uh, kind of focused, I think of it as kind of, there's a, a people side and a, and a process side and um, set up to, to focus on working together better and using technical approaches to improve the software that's developed and develop and deliver in an evolutionary style. I guess that's my one sentence for it. All right. That, that sounds great. How uh, 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 How is it different than, or is it the same thing as terms like agile software development? Should I be using those interchangeably or how do you define that? Yeah. So agile is a term, it's, it's more of an umbrella term is how I think of it, that, that lots of different processes might be agile. Um, uh, Scrum is probably the most well-known at this point, um, but there was FDD and there were other ones out there, the Crystal series from Alistair Coburn and so on. So they they all share some characteristics, um, tending to kind of take more evolutionary approaches, although I don't think that's necessarily universal. Um, but uh, XP has its own twists on some things and Scrum has its own twists and others have other, other twists. So all in the same family. Bill, I want to ask... Uh, about a personal appreciation I had about extreme programming. I, I loved it when I was a developer 15 years ago. I just was just just like like in a dream. It's, it's exactly what I wanted to, to do for the rest of my life. Uh, I remember facing a lot of uh, friction when I was trying to teach that in Central America. That was something like radical, hence the extreme. And I, and I, and I like it that that side of the meaning extreme because it was something new, uh, but but philosophically it was always a problem for me because I would have preferred a different name, <laughs> like or maybe extreme but extreme something like like I don't know extreme good practices <laughs> I don't know I don't know like <laughs> you think about that I mean it's, yeah. <laughs> it's philosophy well, it, it is. <laughs> yeah there's kind of a of the name, right? It's like the name that's going to attract the attention and get things moving. Right. You know, it's the name you want, to, you know, 10 years from now. I think today's thing, um, I think of mob programming, you know, the, the idea of the whole team programming together. Right, and, right. You know, mob has these connotations that really aren't great, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get it, I get Even it. the nicer ones, they're still, you know, these people kind of right. out of control, you know. And, uh, uh, you know, so people are trying for ensemble programming is kind of a replacement term these days. But, uh, you know, w when Woody talks about it, it's like, well, you know, I talked about lots of things and it only started getting attention when I had this term for it, you know. And uh, <laughs> I think extreme right. programming had some of the same thing, you know. And then it, when it was new, it was it maybe attractive because of that. But, uh, uh, you know, it, it somehow doesn't sound as nice for the manager, like, you know everything's going to go extreme and w w what can I trust, you know? So yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sort of like the uh, scrum master term, right? I mean, in, yeah, in, that's in one agile development, yeah. right? Yeah. It's one I would rather change. I'd rather change the name of sprints to I uh, prefer iterations over sprint uh, mm -hmm, as others mm -hmm. do. I know, you know, I mean, for a collaborative methodology like scrum to have a role in it called the master of, of anything seems a little, right. a, a little contradictory. Right. Uh, but, I guess, you know, at a certain point, certainly after 20 years, we seem to be stuck with certain terms, yeah, right? It is, what it is, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's still a lot of value. I really, I really, I really lo love that. I mean, just mind blowing. I mean, the first time you faced the concept, it is mind blowing. Yeah. So I have still, a, the uh, Extreme Program has a nice place in my heart. <laughs> Great. How did, how did you get into uh, XP, into extreme programming, Bill? Uh, well, I was working at um, uh, basically a financial institution kind of place. And uh, we were, th their tradition was more on the, the big waterfall driven kind of projects. And we were trying to do some more early web stuff and finding like, you know, the, the, the long process kind of stuff. And it, uh, RUP, the Rational Unified Process was a big deal at that point. And the bank had their or their standard documents and so on. And we just kind of found it didn't really fit how we were trying to develop. So we worked out um, somewhat of a, a lighter process and, uh, uh, you know, like three week iterations and things like that. And, uh, you know, as, as I kind of tried to reach out and understand what others were doing, ran across um, the XP kind of stuff. Uh, I'd known, of Kent Beck and Ward Cunningham from the earlier stuff they'd done, but uh, the XP package 
definitely interested me. I got to go to the first um, training class uh, they did for that. Um, is it XP immersion? I can't remember the name now, but uh, so got in with that and uh, got involved there and kind of moved on from there. Yeah, I guess. Nice. And certainly uh, test driven development is a, is a, is a key component of that. Um, I'm, I'm curious, what's your, what's your take on um, TDD uh, these days? You know, how widely accepted is it? How much do you have to still explain it to people or, you know, what's the adoption rate? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's definitely something where I meet a lot of people who aren't familiar with it or not using it or not using it well and that kind of thing. I don't know, to some extent that's because, you know, no one brings me in and says, our company's doing so great. You know, we've got all these techniques <laughs> we're doing wonderfully and, you know, just come in anyway, you know, it doesn't happen like that. You know, it's more right. like, well, <laughs> we, we're realizing we got to do this and that and, and people that don't know it and, and have to work on it. I mean, it's certainly more known than, it, you know, 10 years ago, say, and, uh, uh, I do run into places that use it or teams that use it or people that use it. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I, I sense it's more, but I don't sense it's universal in any kind of stretch, you know. <laughs> have, have you seen um, uh, over the years any sort of trend on maybe who, who adopts it better or maybe cases where you're OK with them not adopting TDD? Yeah, I don't I don't know that I can say. I'm always hesitant on the trend stuff because I just, you know, it's like I'm one little drop in a very large ocean of <laughs> stuff going on. And what I see probably isn't too super representative. Um, I mean, I, I definitely have seen things where, I mean, I guess it's kind of the traditional things of like, if it's if it's a super graphics heavy application, TDD in its simple form is not necessarily going to help you that much. If it's mm -hmm. statistical kind of stuff, you know, it's it's not like you write a formula and TDD is going to verify these three cases. Um, I think of a group doing like geologic modeling kind of stuff, and they'd throw this random things at these models, and you know, you'd talk to them, and it's like the the PhD that's writing the specs for this thing, he doesn't know the answer. You know, it's like that's why we're writing it is to figure out the answer, and and so right. that at the large scale to say like. Here's the inputs. What's the outputs? You know, that that can't happen. Now, little pieces can benefit and all that. And, uh, you know, somehow you have to give yourself assurance about this thing, whether it's TDD or some other approach. But, uh, yeah, there, there are definitely a few that, you know, find it hard to fit in. Okay, and I ask, what are the, the most common misconceptions or myths about TDD that you have faced? Hmm. Um, well, I, I think there, there are definitely people worry that, you know, oh, we're going to spend all this time writing tests. And if uh, right. the tests will be so uh, sensitive, they'll break all the time. We'll spend all this time fixing them. And, you know, in some ways that can be, um, th th there are skills to writing tests in a way that that's less of an issue. So, Part of it is, you know, if you haven't worked, uh, found those patterns or, or, you know, learned those skills, then yes, your tests do end up very brittle and, and hard to use and so on. But, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be that bad. And uh, uh, other myths, I don't know. I, I seem to run, have seen a lot of groups where they kind of got the test part, but didn't do the refactor part very much. And they've let that part get out of control. And so oh, yeah. they've, they've yeah. been creating tests, but when it's become hard to create the test, they don't say, hey, wait a minute, it shouldn't be this hard, you know, and they'll write their 30 lines of setup and, you know, get everything going and, you know, they're testing and they're trying, but it's it's harder than it has to be. I think I remember, I mean, the, the, two, the two most impact, impactful things about TDD, I think the first one was... Um, the cycle is like, I mean, first half a spec, I mean, like a test that is failing. That is quite <laughs> important. It must fail. <laughs> if you right, if you write as an empty test and it passes, something is really wrong, right? <laughs> like something <laughs> yeah, is not working. Yeah. yeah. But then, but the next step is was, and the next steps are very insightful is, are let now write the code, uh, so that it passes 
so so that you have a green test it doesn't matter the quality of the code in fact intentionally be you can be intentionally messy i mean because what matters is you get that green mm -hmm. and then now you can offer your tribute to the altar of beautiful code and do all the refactoring <laughs> because now you have a point of reference which is that green mm -hmm. right i mean that that is that is very deep <laughs> <laughs> that is very deep i think it's is yeah it's it's it helps the developer to focus i think not to wonder it's it's a powerful tool for 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 concentration for a developer i, I think that's very powerful um, and the other thing I remember was just mind blowing is, is, uh, that I think is, is a very common mistake for a, for a, a novice is understanding that the test, the scenarios that you write are the meaningful scenarios regarding the code you are writing, not necessarily all the scenarios, like, like deceptions. Yeah. I mean, you can make cases like that, but, but, or oh, um, let me put it this or wait, the, the first scenarios that you must be concerned about are the minim, the meaningful scenarios. Mm -hmm. uh, the, mm -hmm. Those scenarios are, I mean, the core of the business. So start by those. <laughs> and then you can think about deceptions and if, if they end up. But, but those scenarios are quite important. Um, yeah, so I think those things. Oh, and the third one was... Uh, Take time to refactor your tests. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Refactoring yeah. the code and yeah. the test. Yeah. So I love that. I mean, it is really, I, I insist, mind blowing. It's, it's not a way, maybe today at the colleges, they teach this, I don't know, I hope, <laughs> this stuff. But by the time we, we had you added Herring and I, I mean, the, the, no consideration about code quality, no consideration about, a refactoring how about maintainability at all or fast yeah. code oh, no, nothing like that so it was a blessing for us i think mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely I, I i like the comment you made there david about the how it gives you focus too in writing because mm -hmm. i think for for me certainly if you know i i'm i, I tend to be a very um very goal oriented, sometimes task oriented person, right? I live off my checklist or I live off the start emails in my inbox, right? And I think when you're coding something and you've got this this huge landscape of things that you could be working on right now, it can be a little bit hard to focus and where to go next and and how to get sort of a warm, fuzzy feeling that you're making progress on this giant problem and going through that that TDD cycle, I think, can be really valuable about, you know, it's, it's, I don't have to write the whole novel right now. I just need to write one sentence that describes this scene, right? You know, it's that sort of thinking of, of a much more focused. Uh, and I think that's really helpful to me. Bill, what's the uh, kind of philosophy that, that you encourage developers new to TDD if you're mentoring them to, to take as they write these tests? Well, um, I think there's, there's, I think this notion that David brought up about, you know, kind of focusing on this kind of main path scenario and understanding what you're trying to really trying to do and, and how mm -hmm. that should work. Um, you know, that that's usually I try and drive off that. And I think it's a challenge for people to kind of take a big problem and simplify it down and kind of keep their mind on what's, what's the real main focus and real main path. Um, uh, the other thing I think is interesting, and I don't know if it's, I don't know if I'd teach it very well, but, but there is, there's design choices involved when you choose which test to write next and, you know, different choices can push you in different directions on the design. And I don't, I don't think I've seen much really written about that, but, um, it, it definitely is the case. I mean, I don't know. I had a couple areas where I, I got deep into understanding parsers at one point and, and, uh, into understanding um, just some choices in the user interfaces in the early days of, of you know, uh, visual computing, I guess you'd say. And, and both those, it was interesting to me, like, you know, if you, if you derive your grammar a certain way, you will derive your program towards, say, 
top down parsing or bottom up parsing or things like mm-hmm, that. And, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm, and that's mm-hmm. the, the test you choose next will kind of encourage that to emerge. And the same thing in the UI world that there, you know, there were decisions. I mean, there was kind of a decision about, you know, are you moving the the screen or are you moving the viewport on the screen? Right. And they, they flipped that decision a few years ago, right. That for a long time, I think I'll, I'll say it wrong, but you know, uh, at some point they switched the, uh, the scrolling. So you were dragging your, your document or, you know, to make it more like compatible with the way you think about an iPad or something like that, you know, you're kind of flicking the paper up and down as opposed uh-huh. to dragging a viewport over across your, your paper. And, uh, you know, that decision kind of held for, you know, 15, 20 years, but then has kind of flipped with, with the phones and iPads and things like that coming common. Yeah, interesting. So, yeah. So, are you a uh, are you a big proponent then of like emergent design as you're coding something? How do you balance that with you know enterprise clients maybe that you work with who who want to have like an enterprise architecture group and enforce a, a big upfront design across teams? How do you how do you strike that balance? Yeah, I mean, I definitely uh, try and take that evolutionary approach on the the the, the functionality parts of things. Um, you know, the more architectural end of things, um, uh, well, in consulting, most of the time I wasn't brought in for that part of things. So a lot of times those mm-hmm. decisions were, were pretty well, uh, set, you know, but, uh, when I have been involved with them, you know, it really is, uh, there's more of a prototyping phase and things like that to kind of make sure that the architecture is appropriate for the scale you're talking and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, right. Those emerge as well, though. I mean, I, I, I think it all emerges. You know, <laughs> if if your program succeeds at all, it's going to get extended and changed, and you know, it's 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 going to be there, and <laughs> it's going to emerge whether you want it to or not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there's plenty of you know, like I don't know, use bank software or something, and you can see the roots of you know those old. Uh, uh, terminals they used to use, you know, and like tab over to this field and, and those kind of things. Right. And, you know, th- th- you can see that that's still influencing the software in the back. And, uh, you know, that's a good thing from their perspective, you know, if they can keep that running 25 years and making money the whole time, that's always great. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but the architecture thing too, I mean, you know, uh, 20 years ago, nobody was using Docker, you know, or anything like that, you know, and that stuff has all become much more common and much more manageable. Um, I think, you know, you see the 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 growth of of that in the way teams work now, and they're much more able to tackle those kind of architectural scaling kind of things than that than you know even a few years ago. Mm-hmm. Now, I have an observation. I I I became in love with functional programming thanks to TDD uh, because the the way that actually works very well TDD is when you fuck and you um, test the behavior. Uh, and that's a very functional concern. Um, so the, 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 the question or the opinion I want to ask you is, is uh, I mean, the, the, the modern languages are, more, are adding more and more functional uh, uh, features, right? I mean, more. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, it seems to be a transition towards that. In fact, there are many behaviors, even in libraries like React. It's 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 that immutability, uh, those things that are very valuable when you are doing TDD. Uh, I wonder who is pushing that. I mean, what is pushing that transition? Is are things like TDD, <laughs> like <laughs> like uh, I mean, by itself the functional paradigm is is just wonderful, but but. Uh, but we had had that since since 60 years ago <laughs> right <laughs> but, but now you can see that transformation immutability i mean that kind of thing uh, yeah I, I don't think yeah. it's tdd that's pulling that I, I don't know i mean i agree with you it's becoming more common and you know mm-hmm. most of the languages now seem to have at least the the pipeline kind of uh, map and reduce and all those kind of right pipeline operations on streams and sequences or whatever and uh uh, that's definitely a step forward. And uh, I don't know, I uh, the work, I don't know, like the last language I used um, at a company was Kotlin, you know, which 
is mm. kind of mostly a better Java, but definitely has some of those characteristics much more cleanly than than some others. And then in the stuff I do for my own programming, like on Twitch, I've been working in Swift a lot over the last mm-hmm. couple of years. And mm-hmm. and same thing there. You know, they've got some pretty sophisticated uh, stream and sequence operations and, and so on. And they've been more or less integrating that in with the the Swift Swift UI kind of stuff is a little more in that vein. It, it's not designed for testing at all. I mean, it's like totally okay, okay, to okay. really do TDD <laughs> in that sense. Um, yeah. I know John Reed was trying to to get Swift UI components and working on them TDD style, and just really frustrated with some of the assumptions built in on on that. Um, but the style that says you know much more functional kind of behavior side and and the view is just going to reflect that, you know, it's going to be a function of that, of that model you have and, uh, you know, keeping things mutable and using streams and all that stuff that makes the functional stuff kind of nice. Yeah. Right. Right. Good point. Nice. You mentioned uh, Twitch, Bill. And, and so I want to hear a little bit more about how you got into, I mean, I, I, I first became familiar with Twitch from like, my son watching video gamers while they play games. You're using it for a much more business uh, uh, <laughs> practice there of uh, people watching right. you code, basically. How did you get into that? Yeah, and, um, and I think that's really cool. I, I'm not sure what triggered the start. If it was, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, uh, but anyway, I don't know, maybe a year, year and a half ago, uh, just decided I wanted to, to uh, practice what I'm preaching in a sense of just take some sort of programming idea and implement it on screen and get over the fact that, you know, it's not going to be polished or any of that stuff, you know, especially <laughs> with me, but uh, you know, it's like, there are going to be mistakes there because that's the way I got to get through stuff. And I'm going to find out like, Oh, I don't know what I'm doing on this part. And, you know, and this is, this is just the reality, you know, <laughs> right. of, of what it's like. And and it's just going to be, that's what I'm delivering in this, you know, it, uh, which makes it easy. takes that pressure off, you know, that you're not going to be delivering perfect video presentations of something you've worked through three times in advance to make sure it's just so it's like, <laughs> no, it's just it's whatever I'm up to. So, um, so you're not doing, you're not doing a lot of prep before those that of kind no, of I'm, sort I'm of trying pre-writing to do it almost or... none. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've, yeah. I've got, uh, well, I have different programs that like, Oh, I wanted to do this. And, you know, 15 years ago, I put this aside and didn't do it. It, uh, The one I worked on for a while was um, this sort of, you, you'd have a grid and just kind of ways to, to kind of quickly fold in on values and segment it and things like that. And uh, it's, um, I don't know, that was probably 50 or 80 episodes of, of just me going through all the stuff with that. Okay. Now let's hook it up to a database. Let's do this. Let's do that. Um, and uh, I try to be, I mean, mostly what I do is, uh, you know, five minutes or 10 minutes of like, oh, what's the, what am I going to focus on tomorrow? I'll make one or two or three slides that I can show mm-hmm. at the front and, and, uh, and not, not dig in and do stuff on the side. So um, yeah. lately I've been doing this uh, daily or week, weekdays, Monday through Friday. And so it's like, I, you know, it even more so I can't just like spend half a day of research outside, you know, it just doesn't even make sense. So, uh, right. it's, it's, uh, a little raw, <laughs> but do you but get uh, live feedback from anybody, uh, oh, I, watching I get a little it? Bit, that's like uh, of the coding um, itself. Yeah, I get a little bit. I mean, I have a couple people that are pretty regular and then, and then, uh, sure. others that pop in and it's not a big audience <laughs> not like uh, video gamers can expect there. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, sometimes I can get some real good and somebody popped in today and just as I was kind of explaining, here's where we are. And we were just about to try and debug this and realize like, oh, it, you know, he said, I happy I could be your rubber duck, you know, kind of thing. Cause <laughs> it's like explaining it. You go, oh wait, now I know why this is not doing that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, right. it's, it's, uh, it, it's that for me. I think, um, I'm, I'm thinking of doing some uh, refactoring video course kind of thing. And so this is some of this is just kind of me having material, you know, writing a program big enough to be interesting to refactor and things like that. So, uh, mm-hmm. you know, for the course, it'll go back to the polished mode and practice and all that stuff. But, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah, I guess if you, uh, I, I love it. <laughs> how, um, how, how much do you uh, teach on uh, pair programming still? How much are you emphasizing that in XP coaching? 
Um, almost none. I mean, usually if, if there's anything going on nowadays, it's, it's, uh, it's probably ensemble programming to, for groups that want to try that. I'd say that that has popped up a lot more than pair programming. Um, although the last, the last group I worked with, they were, um, pairs and, uh, they'd split up into either ensemble or, uh, a couple trios or pairs or whatever, but they, they were pretty good about always working with somebody. And, uh, you know, I have appreciated that in the groups I work with, but much less, um, much less of just like, oh, we should pair and it's going to be exactly two people. And it's going to be this kind of way that was more <laughs> what, what we did a few years back, I guess. Could you uh, define ensemble programming for those who may sure. not be familiar? Uh, yeah. So um, it's, uh, uh, well, Woody Zool at least popularized the technique that they developed at Hunter where he was working. And uh, it's the notion that you just get the whole team programming together. You have people take turns being the typist. And uh, some people do it with a style where they have one person that's kind of designated as as the the voice of the team and kind of telling the typist what's what's next and so on um and the the team may be it may be just the programmers it may be programmers in qa or uh uh user end of people too customers of some sort uh but anyway working together taking turns rotating usually fairly quickly but there's a lot of variation in how how they do it um but the idea is to try and get the best of everybody's point of view rather than kind of whoever, you know, the person or two that's working there at, at one moment, their, their personal best might not be as good as the team best. Uh, I think that, go ahead. I wanted to share that trigger and pair programming. The, the thing that was most difficult for me at the beginning was when I was not the type pair, but the driver, uh, that rule that when you see the person that is writing making a mistake, count until <laughs> three. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> because most of the time they will realize the, the mistake before you say. So that mm -hmm. part, just refrain yourself. <laughs> it was <Right>. so hard. <laughs> yeah. It's fun. I mean, it's fun. It is actually a very creative process. Definitely, definitely. It's fun. I, I Yeah, and like that's it. kind of the part I miss on when I'm working on Twitch. I'm basically solo. I mean, there are some occasional comments and stuff, but uh, it's like, oh, I, I really wish I had a person or a small group to work with on this. But, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's tough enough to get my own time together to do it and much less try and work up a group and then deal with the technology of all that. But, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's nice in the sense that I think – in a way, mob programming is an easier, easier ramp up than pairing because pairing, you're just so directly, you know, two people. Mm -hmm. And if, if you don't quite click or, you know, these, these things get in the way, it, it's, it's easier to do, you know, to kind of run into conflict that way. The mob, you know, you can sit back a little more and uh, uh, it, it just feels more gentle. You know, you can pop in and pop out and it's okay. And all, all that's kind of easier. It's, it's a challenge that, it it does take. I mean, you are applying a team's worth of of eyes to a given thing, and you know that can feel expensive. But on the other side, you know, do you need to stand up? No, we just sat there and talked together all day. We know what's going on. You know, do you need this? <laughs> do you need that? Some of those things just kind of fade away in that context, which which can be nice. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I, I want to go back to uh, a, a question on testing and something that I've seen as a challenge before in growing tech teams with testing, where um, they start out with, uh, you know, m maybe a very good TDD practice and lots of unit tests and maybe set up a rule of like every user story needs an acceptance level or behavior driven, you know, a UI type of test attached to it as well. And works beautifully at the beginning, but then as the team grows and over months or years, they end up with a very large suite of uh, ATD tasks, of UI tasks, uh, that then start to become more brittle uh, on us to handle updating on a story by story type of basis. Like, how do you, have you seen that challenge before in growing organizations? 
of maintaining those tests from in the past and and how do you coach teams through that? What would you recommend? Yeah, I I definitely have seen teams with that challenge. And I think the UI tests, well, they 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 involve more of the system, which which has some benefits, but it definitely has the costs. And mm-hmm. um, the the ones that are so, I mean, sometimes you get ones that are so oriented towards exactly the way we're doing things today, down to the level of the interface and all that stuff. You know that that stuff just changes. I mean, that's that's you know, um, you look at Google today versus. 10 years ago or Amazon or any of these others, you know, the, the way that stuff goes is just so different. Um, the, I don't think those tests have a chance in that sense. You know, if you're going to focus on <laughs> actual mechanics of the UI, that's really, really a rough way right. to go. Um, I mean, I, I prefer when we can focus on just the, the more behavioral tests and, and limit that stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't mind if there's our tests, you know, to kind of, my friend called it taste the peanut butter, you know, just kind of go in and check a little bit here and there and make sure everything's kind of sensible at some, you know, sensibly functioning at some level. But um, I don't know the, the detailed ones. uh, I just, I discourage it. If you're going to write that, that level of tests, you know, I want it to be at a level that's still focused on the behavior that you're trying to talk Mm -hmm. about in the Mm -hmm. system and, and uh, let the rest of that be more incidental and, I'm happier if I can go in a level down and, and make sure that's right. Um, I mean, I don't do a lot of like super heavy UI intensive, you know, this little dial really needs to move 47 pixels kind of stuff. So maybe right. I'm <laughs> able to avoid that, that uh, mm-hmm. where those might be more critical, but yeah, I kind of, kind of do want to. That makes sense. I, I like that phrase, taste the peanut butter. Is that kind of like a smoke test? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Just check that. everything's alive. The UI loaded. <laughs> the The knob is there perhaps, but we're not going to test that knob on every user story in the backlog right now. Yeah. This, this came from Steve Metzger. I, you may have even known him. Uh, he died a few, well, he died in 2007, I think. So it's been a while, but uh, he, he liked to talk about the, the user testing being like that, um, the end user testing, you know, that your, mm-hmm. your people who are real QA people, they're going to go in and try all these settings. The people who are end users, they just kind of want to go in and make sure their, their scenario looks plausibly working and, and that kind of thing. And they're not going to push the corners too hard. So, yeah. So beyond uh, technical practices, you also talk about a lot of other practices in um, uh, agile development, uh, in, in software development in general, and you've written a lot of things about user stories, for example. Um, so I have I have both a a, a, a a praise and a bone to pick, I guess, mm-hmm. on this topic with you around user stories. You've written a lot around that, and and um, and, and you you came up with the acronym Invest in your users, user stories. Correct. And, uh, I've always, I've always loved that. I think it's, and I think it's one of, uh, one of your more popular thought pieces and one I've frequently quoted, uh, when talking to people about agile and talking to them about user stories and the impact of how you write those on the development itself. Um, so how, how did you come up with that, that phrase? Well, I, I was working with uh, pretty heavily with somebody on the, the customer end of the, of the spectrum and mm-hmm. trying to help them understand kind of what we mean by user stories and, you know, some way to, to help them judge, like, is this thing making sense? So uh, basically, I just sat down one day and wrote about, I don't know, 50, maybe maybe 75 just words that associated with different aspects of testing and uh, of the user stories rather. And, you know, um, I can't even come up with them. I don't, I don't think I kept my little sheet even, but, you know, <laughs> I, I wanted to, you know, make sure, you know, just things that could be true. And then I just started clustering those and started mm-hmm. trying to assign a letter to a cluster, you know, a sort of, you know, the most popular word in the cluster or something and scramble around and, you know, play with my scrabble head and, uh, try and come <laughs> up with a word. And it, it, it could have been vestige or vesting and invest seemed like a better choice. So uh, that's where we ended up with. 
Uh, it's, it's a great term. And yeah, now I'm now I'm imagining and uh, that you're sitting there with a uh, dictionary and writing some <laughs> Python or C code to try and match your favorite words to letters in the, uh, oh, in the uh, words in the dictionary, right? <laughs> yeah, no, I wasn't that sophisticated. I'm just, I'm just dribbling. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I love the acronym and, and I'm going to I'm, I'm going to say what invest is for, the, for those who who are not familiar with it and see if you can pick up on what my bone is to pick with you about that. Uh, so invest spells out some things that you should uh, consider when writing user stories, and they're things that you have to balance against each other. Really, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong here, Bill, but I always say like you can't you can't achieve all of these things perfectly at once, right? They're really kind of different criteria that you think about as you're trying to find the best balance in writing a good user story. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, all right. So, picture the word invest in your mind. I is independent, negotiable, valuable, estimable, small, and testable, right? I get it right? Yep. But did you hear me mispronounce estimable? <laughs> <laughs> That's my bone. Are you paying attention? <laughs> I'm not you. <laughs> I know what the, I, whenever I explain that to someone, I'm always like, okay, so it's, it's uh, independent, negotiable, valuable, and then you've got to be able to estimate it. Estimate, because <laughs> this I don't, right. I don't know if estimable is a real word, but I sure know I can never say it and not sound a little foolish. <laughs> <laughs> well, so uh, I, yeah, I, when I look, when I was pulling this together, you know, my word I had was estimatable and estimatable and uh, started looking in like several dictionaries and they didn't have that word. And it's like, oh, <laughs> the word they had was estimable, meaning uh, can be estimated or uh -huh. able to hold in high esteem kind of thing. You know, that's kind of probably the more common uh, right. meaning of that, you know. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, I think all of those, I, 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 don't, I don't work super strictly. And it's kind of funny sometimes I find people that are much more strict about these than I am, you know, it's like, eh. <laughs> but uh, uh, one, one I... I, I kind of am not changing the official acronym, but I do use two different phrases a lot more. Um, for for E, I tend to say end to end and ask for more focus on that. In, in some mm -hmm. ways, valuable to me is kind of covering that, but uh, just ran into so many places. I don't know. You run into a lot of teams where nobody really owns the end to end flow. And so here's the team working on this little piece and here's the team working on that little piece. And, you know, customers care about the end to end flow and, and somebody does, but the teams don't care. And so their stories reflect that. And they're very, it's kind of like taking some reaching inside, taking some little piece of the system out and, and saying, Oh, this, this is a complete thing. And here's the, the behavior. Uh, that's that's not really something the users are going to be able to prioritize and deal with and all that stuff. You know, that's something you developers care about. And and so I, I do really push teams to to see the end-to-end -end value and make sure that's there. And then the other one, um, I've been using the word scalable more than small because, um, well, small was there because the person I first helped with them was definitely writing way, way, way too big things mm -hmm. that, you know, <laughs> give this to the team. And three months later, you might have something you could call that, you know, kind of thing. And uh, I, I, I've been trying scalable because I think there are times where you need, you need stories at different scales for different purposes. And I, I want to be able to treat it like a dial and, and bring it up and down. If I'm yeah. planning out a system in general, I don't need, you know, one day stories, you know, so I'm going to have 3000 little cards or something. I don't want that when I'm planning at the top level, you know, I want a, a, a much smaller handful, you know, five or 10 or maybe 20, but even 20 sounds like a lot of things, you know, but I want something I can focus on at, at a level. So, so I do tend to push that. I mean, when you're implementing them, I want them on the small side or smaller side, but um, Jeff Patton has a great phrase about, you know, if, if you kind of atomize everything, it's like, you're looking at a bag, you know, leaves that you would bag up and a bag of leaves, you've, you've lost the structure of the tree that, that generated them. And all you have mm -hmm. is a bag of leaves and there's just a bunch of stuff. And it's hard <laughs> to kind of rebuild the picture of what you're really trying to accomplish. Yeah, but absolutely. Uh, yeah. That makes sense. I like that metaphor. Um, so how, um, uh, how do you recommend a uh, engineering manager 
keeps their skills up to date. And 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 maybe there's a maybe there's some parallel to you as as a consultant as a coach. Also, you know, how do you keep your your own skills up to date outside of the work that you're doing with your clients? Well, yeah, I can start with how I do. I mean, like the Twitch sessions are one of those things for me, just like get in there mm-hmm. and be hands-on programming and thinking about when that part, you know, when when that works well, when it doesn't work well, was it because I was doing TDD or doing it wrong or it wasn't up to the job, those kind of things, you know, build that that kind of regular work. And, uh, and also for me, just kind of regular study. I mean, I don't read books while I'm sitting there on Twitch usually, but, uh, <laughs> uh you know, I, I definitely keep, keep a, a stream of those going along just to kind of touch base with what's been done there. And I don't know, I've, I've gone the more, maybe I'm just going backwards or something, but, you know, I really have been kind of digging back into older books and, and seeing kind of different philosophies going on there more in the, 70s early 80s kind of stuff um several compiler books lately for whatever reason but uh uh just just curious to see what how they were thinking about things and what what happened you know it's um i mean like there was a time when subroutines weren't a thing and stacks weren't a thing and lots (laughs) of things weren't a thing you know and to pull that structure out and make sense of it from from the nothing or the you know whatever you were looking at in those days, you know, there's, there's some process going on there that I think is really just kind of fascinating that, that has happened. And, and some of these abstractions kind of come back around, you know, periodically and um, it'll be back again. And I'm sure. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I I have two questions. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. um, Related to. I, I really I am interested about these two things. The first thing is, what are your favorite tools for collaboration? I, I mean, I'm going to give you an example. Back in the days when I was a developer, I'm, I, stopped, I stopped being a developer like 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 five years ago. It is, uh, and I miss it in many senses. But I I remember back then that the only way I could be happy doing pair programming remotely with someone else in Argentina, in Costa Rica with Argentina, let's say, was using Tmux for doing pair programming in a Unix console. And I loved it. It was, it, it was, it felt like the person was next to me. I mean, it was just magical. It was just great. Uh, things like that. I mean, is are there a set of tools that you like to use when you are collaborating with someone else in coding? Um, I, I, well, Usually I don't get much choice, you know, the team is using okay. S- right. Slack or Zoom or yeah. Pants or whatever they all are, you know, there's uh, not not much choice I get in that usually. So we kind of muddle through with whatever there is. Um, I don't know, I've dabbled with bits and bits of everything and they all kind of, you know, they all kind of do something and they all kind of have their problems. So it's take right. your pick. <laughs> I see, I but, see. Okay. Yeah. No, that's fine. That, the second thing I want your opinion about is, is there any new thing in the programming world that is emerging and excites you? Hmm. I don't know. Um, the I, I've been definitely interested to learn Swift the last couple of years and, and trying mm-hmm. to understand the the patterns and stuff that they use there. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I've been real excited, like the mob programming. Um, I mean, that's not not newish. I mean, it's getting a little aged at this point, but, you know, I really was happy to see that sort of come in as a new kind of way of approaching things with teams and, and teams getting a lot of benefit out of it, even if they decide we don't do this all the time or whatever, but, you know, having that, that freedom to, to be in bigger or smaller groups and and take advantage of it. I, I have liked seeing that. Um, I don't know. Again, I keep going back to uh, the other one that pops in my mind was Kanban, you know, just that, that approach mm-hmm. of just watching you the flow and making sure the flow uh, you're paying attention to that um, more small K Kanban, if you want to say it that way, than not <laughs> David Anderson's kind of mm-hmm. uh, version of it, but, but just the notion of, of managing things through that. But again, that's something that's, you know, it wasn't there 20 years ago. It was there five years ago, you know, it was there 10 years ago, really, mm-hmm. I guess, but um, and then I think, like you said, all the functional stuff that's emerging, you know, it seems like 
languages seemed kind of stuck for a while. And it seems in the last few years that just, just a real flourishing of lots of different languages. And uh, I'm curious to see what comes out of that. It's, it's, well, I wouldn't say it's impossible to keep up with it all, but it's certainly impossible for me to keep up with it all, you know, and uh, <laughs> it's like, even just in the Swift world, right? They just had WWDC and, oh, new new features in Swift. And, you know, here's a page full of these. And, you know, it's it's really rough keeping up there. But uh, um, I do want to do more functional programming stuff and get get into that again. Nice, nice. Thank you. How, how about for Excellent. you all? What is there particular new things popping up that you're interested in? Oh, well, I, I, I am very curious about what's next for React. I mean, I, I gotta be honest. I, I was, I'm still so excited about have a React because when I was a developer in the early year, I mean, I'm talking, yeah, I mean, early, I mean, at the beginning of the century, <laughs> that sounds too, too far away, right? Like, yeah, that, that's getting but, 20 years too, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. But, but I remember dealing with uh, uh, GSP for doing the front end in Java. I mean, I don't remember the framework, but uh, I was doing, and I remember hating front end so much because it wasn't as, as predictable and, re and easy to reason with as the backend code. And I hated that. I hated that so much. When I saw React, now I, I I was so happy. I I, I wished I, I were a developer again just to go deeply in React because we'll bring the reasoning that I had in the backing now in the front end. <laughs> I can reason about that at a mm -hmm. deeper level. So now I'm curious how what's the future? I mean, what they have. The other thing I really like is uh but maybe it's just a guilty pleasure, is closure. I, I just want to say, <laughs> I hope that it gets more attention. <laughs> it's just not, it's just nice. It's just a nice mm -hmm. little language. I love it so much. Uh, okay. That's me. Yeah. It's, it's, it's cute. <laughs> <laughs> it's a cute language. I'll, I'll say what, what thing I'm curious about in terms of what's coming next in development. And, and I'll say I'm, I'm both curious and skeptical of this to be clear up front are uh, things like GitHub Copilot. You know, this idea of having an AI driven pair programmer. And certainly on the one hand, I, I, I like the idea of um, it's sort of like David was describing a challenge in pair programming of not correcting every mistake you see and counting to three before you do. I like the idea maybe of having an AI that is telling me that mistake right away, but I don't feel as uh, as ashamed as, as I would if David were standing over my shoulder telling me that <laughs> constantly. But um, so, I, you know, there's some benefits there of that sort of like autocomplete type of aspect of it uh, yeah. on, a, on a bigger scale. Um, but um, but also, you know, it does uh, my skepticism is heavily rooted in what we see in, in a broader technology context right now of how often algorithms tend to drive you towards, you know, bubbles of, of thought um, or, or, you know, bubbles of just what is the common practice to do here or what has happened across the most GitHub projects, which may or may not be the thing that's actually the best idea to do in my use case. Right. So I'm, I'm curious to see how that will work out in our industry. Uh, but I have a healthy dose of uh, old guy skepticism about it too. <laughs> Nice. Well, Bill, thank you so much for taking the time with us today. This has been a wonderful conversation. Um, uh, tell our uh, listeners real quick uh, how they can uh, learn more about you or work with you if they'd like to and, and your Twitch handle too. Yeah. So um, uh, xp123.com is my main site. Uh, I'm at wake on Twitter. Uh, the easiest way to get to my Twitch is xp123.com slash Twitch. Um, and xp123.com slash YouTube will get, take you to the videos uh, that I've done so far. Um, you'd have to be pretty determined to watch them all, I'll say, but uh, <laughs> uh, YouTube posts them for free, so thank you. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, one of those, um, or email me, william.wake at acm.org will, will definitely work as my generic address. So I'd love to hear from people. And thank you awesome. both for having me today.
Oh, our pleasure. Thank you. And and thank you again for, you know, being one of the first people, the first person to teach me about Agile so many years ago. Really appreciate it. I know there are, are many, many other people like me that you've impacted in your work in the industry. So I'm really grateful for that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. That's nice. Thanks. Thanks for joining us on the Scaling Tech Podcast, where we help you manage your growing engineering team. Brought to you by agilityfeet.com experts in staffing engineering teams in Latin America for clients globally. For more information on today's episode and to submit your ideas for future guests, please visit scalingtechpod.com.